So, Thelma, the reason I chose to speak with you about this um, is for a few reasons. Um, the most important reason for me was because I know that you spent many decades of your life working with especially seniors and seniors who lived in homes. And so you have a good, very good understanding, perhaps more so than most people, of what that life is like. And I know you went through, your husband had an illness before he passed, right? And now you yourself, you're here at Amy McClure House, and you've reached the very admirable age of 100 just last two weeks ago, right? July 27th? Eight. 28th, okay. July 28th. And for this project, COVID-19 Culture, what we're doing at Heritage Saskatchewan is collecting stories from all across the province, from people of many different backgrounds, people who are Indigenous, people who are new to Canada, people from rural Saskatchewan, people who from urban Saskatchewan, to speak to them about what their life was like during this first stage of this pandemic that we're calling COVID-19. Um, because in the past, when great global events like this have happened, sometimes everyday people's voices aren't recorded or captured. And so we wanted to, to capture those everyday ordinary voices. Though I wouldn't say that you're everyday and ordinary, you're a, a famous celebrated photographer. However, I know that you have a very deep understanding and compassion and respect for those ordinary men and women of Saskatchewan. And so I thought that you were the perfect person to speak to that older demographic from your own experience and also from your professional experience of having met and spoken with and done your own ethnographic interviews with so many of them. And so that's why I reached out to you to ask you to be part of this project. So I have five questions I'm going to ask you. And we've asked the same questions to everyone in the project. And so that's to keep a uniformity when we're doing our editing and, and compiling all of this. We will edit these interviews down based on those questions. However, the raw material in its entirety will be given to the archives so that anyone in the future, they can access that material to learn about this time in Saskatchewan's history. But for now, for our immediate purposes, like I said, these five questions are going to help us frame our editing process. And so that's why everyone's getting asked those same questions. However, when I've asked you those questions and you've answered them, at the end, I'll leave time in case you want to speak to anything that I haven't asked. Does that all sound good to you? Sounds great. Okay. So with that being said, I'm going to start the primary recording now. And I'm going to just make sure this one's good. And so now we are recording. So this is Kristen Catherwood, the Director of Living Heritage for Heritage Saskatchewan. It's Thursday, August 13th, 2020. And I'm here today with Thelma Stevens Pepper. And we are going to be speaking about um, COVID-19 which is a, uh, a global pandemic that we've been living through here in Saskatchewan in 2020. And so Thelma, my very first question is a very simple one. It's just to ask you when and where you were born. Yes, I was born on July 28th, 1920 in Kingston, Nova Scotia. Uh, it's about uh, 20 miles from the larger town of Kentville, and right close to Grand Pre, which I don't think they talk about in history much because thousands of French Canadians were expelled from the province uh, after it was about a hundred years old, and uh, they thought maybe the French would uh, caused trouble, so they wanted to get rid of them. So they, all these ships lined up on a certain day, and all the women and children and animals 
and everything they owned, they all lined up and got on these boats and didn't know where they were going. So that was, I guess it was because of my father, but that had such an impression on me in my early life. And there's many historical places in Nova Scotia because it was founded in uh, 1605. So the first, I should say, the first white family that settled in America settled in Nova Scotia. So Let Thelma, me oh, sorry. See, I was just wondering anything else, where I was born mm -hmm. and uh, where I lived. And there was Acadia University, it was only about 40 minutes. So it was exciting one day <laughs> when I was called to the front door for someone that uh, wanted to see me. I found out it was the president of Acadia University that wanted to give me a scholarship. So that I hadn't thought of going to you. It was in the 30s, so there wasn't much money. But uh, that was exciting. And then one of my professors at Acadia uh, happened to be a woman. I can't think of any other woman that was a professor at that time. Anyway, she became the Dean of Women at McGill University and taught uh, botany, which, uh, and invited me to join her and be her little assistant. So I was thrilled. I'd never been, uh, never been Toronto or Montreal or even um, west at all. So it was a new venture for me. That's where, just one more thing about McGill. Uh, there was a pulp and paper research institute there. And uh, Dr. Hibbert, the director, had 12 wood chemists that were taking their PhD degree. And so Dr. Roscoe, being a botanist, was asked to teach the class in plant anatomy. So I was the little laboratory teacher. And, and of course, that's where I met my husband. So I guess the rest of my story is married life. But uh, first we moved to Guelph, Ontario for a couple of years. But you know, working on pesticides for the Dominion Rubber Company didn't appeal to my husband at all. And so he got this job at teaching at the University of Saskatchewan. So that was exciting for me to see another part of Canada. And that's what brought you here to that's Saskatchewan? That's what brought me here. And I was a house mother, I guess you'd say, because uh, I never worked except for a few months before my first child was born. So any comments I have are things that I believe your, if you want children, your family should come first. And that's why I reflect on the things I thought was important in bringing up my family uh, that, uh, that you could do even with an extreme pandemic. You could do all these things with your children. And sure, you weren't earning money, but I don't know, we lived in a house where I don't think any young person would live in today, but the children were happy. And uh, so we hiked and uh, 
did a lot of hiking, studying the birds and the uh, plants. That was especially interesting. I could teach the children that you didn't know. Uh, you didn't know a plant just because of the flower. You could work out a plant because of its fruit and its seed. So that, I found that exciting in that. And then, uh, it being interested in the arts, we, again, you could do all this with a pandemic. You could make Play-Doh and make dinosaurs and, and barns and all kinds of things. In the Nova Scotia, it might be a ship or a sailing boat. And uh, the three things in arts for me are doing something with your hands or with your mouth or with words. And with your mouth it would be singing or music of some kind. And with words it would be poetry or uh, just the excitement of putting words together. So isn't that, don't you find that uh, those things, maybe uh, some of them are missing today when the mother is working. And I don't know whether the schools provide a lot of them. How can you expect them to do everything? So we had a great child. I had a great child. Uh, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> Great excitement, sort of, with my children. When one of them won an oratory contest, that made me more excited. Uh, or many other things, but... So... Um, voice and words and things with your hands. So you could do them all in the pandemic, couldn't you? That's a, yes. Yeah. Well, that's in a nutshell. <laughs> it's my uh, uh, early life and my, uh, my first few years of uh, married life and my husband being a university professor. Do you know at that time there were lectures at 8.30 every morning? So that was a difference. And he worked very hard. And in order to get uh, promoted, it was the papers you published. It wasn't uh, teaching. I mean, that was that's what I think was sad. You know, you could you could become a professor easily without uh, without uh, being a good teacher. And so he had graduate students from all over the world, and uh, that, I had to entertain them. <laughs> And, uh, of course, he helped. We both entertained. And my favorite, uh, maybe you're familiar with Nova Scotia, uh, baked beans and brown bread and apple pie. But I lived in, in the Annapolis Valley where apples are, are the main crop. Even in the Depression, it, we weren't hindered by that as much because the apples were sold in Britain. So I got off track, didn't I? But, um, so Thelma, perhaps um, before I go to my next question, we'll just speak a bit about, I know when you were around 60 years old, you, you really embarked on your own artistic career. It, yes, I did. I was, the children had left home and I, uh, I tried reading to children at hospitals, 
but they didn't seem, you know, they'd say, you mean you come here and don't get paid for it? <laughs> and, and so I didn't feel quite at home. And then I started reading to blind students at the university. And um, I, uh, it was my husband that said to me, oh, but you love reading to your children. That's one of the main things I haven't told you about, is how powerful it is to read to your children, especially, uh, I remember a grade one teacher saying that um, she could tell immediately whether a child had been read to, because uh, if they hadn't been, when she was telling the story, they would wander all around the room and not listen, whereas if you'd been read to, you would just sit there and take in the story. So anyway, um, I was, uh, I was talking about uh, my husband, wasn't I? And and he his graduate student. He encouraged you to read to seniors, I think. Or oh you yes, decided to and read to he seniors? was the one that um, he said, "You know, you you loved reading to the children so much. What about older people?" Well, there was a long-term care home just uh, two blocks from where we lived. And so I started up there two days a week. And within two to three weeks, I wasn't reading to them. They were just pouring out their stories to me. And I couldn't believe the helplessness, the poverty, the uh, loneliness. We didn't have, I don't know, we didn't, have these in Nova Scotia. 